Hello everyone, this is part two of my series on laziness in Haskell, and at the end of the last video I left things off with a question, which was, given the fact that Haskell is pure, and given the fact that compilers in strict languages are able to sort of, you know, rearrange the program when they know that functions don't perform side effects, why would it possibly be the case that Haskell would suffer from those same downsides? As it turns out, it does, and so I'd like to take a look at some examples of that today. So I want to start by looking at this function, and this is a function that I've used as an example many, many times, and I'm going to use it again. So this is a function that just performs division, but it avoids division by zero exceptions by introducing this guard here. And this particular guard just says if, uh, you know, the second argument is zero, then we'll return nothing, otherwise we'll perform the division. Now this program actually wouldn't actually be any difference between a strict and a lazy language, but this function provides a nice illustration of the fact that Haskell sort of does have side effects, <laughs> and we can't just choose to evaluate things absolutely whenever we want, because if we were to take this expression and float it out here, um, outside of the if, so that it got evaluated first, then of course that would completely defeat the purpose of this function, and we would just immediately raise the exception, which is obviously not what the programmer wants. Now, I know that there's a lot of people who are going to look at this, and they're going to say, oh, you know, this is just evidence that Haskell shouldn't have exceptions, or that it should have a termination checker, and then this wouldn't be a problem. But I don't think that's that's really all that practical. And the reason is, uh, you have to have some way, even if you have a language that is like a proof assistant, and that does have a termination checker, and that doesn't have things like exceptions, you do need to have a way to have, you know, these sort of like, this should never happen in possible cases, which I think is how most people, myself included, use uh, exceptions in Haskell. And, and you know, things like division and head and tail in the prelude, those are maybe not super representative examples, because really what we're doing is we're writing some library and we have some internal invariant that if it's ever violated, it's a bug in our code. So we expect that that will never happen, but we still need something to do. And maybe another example is we call into some FFI uh, you know, library, some C library, and it returns back, it just, you know, failed in some mysterious way, then we need some way to continue evaluation. Uh, we don't want to have to just like return some some garbage value, right? We want to be able to, to halt execution, we want to be able to panic. And that's what exceptions allow us to do. As long as that's in the language, it doesn't matter uh, what other stuff is or is not in the language, um, we're still going to have issues like this, where certain exceptions, evalu or certain expressions, evaluating them can cause these side effects to happen. So this is an example, again, of a function that doesn't change under strict and lazy evaluation semantics. It's just a demonstration that there are some expressions that we do have to care about at least not evaluating them too early. We, we do care about when they are evaluated. So the next thing I'd like to take a look at is, of course, an example where that's not the case, where the meaning of the program actually does change depending on whether you know, we're using strict or lazy evaluation semantics. Now, this is a very simple example. This is just the standard definition of or on Booleans. And here's an example that uses it. And because Haskell's lazy, this particular example evaluates to true because it's going to take this first branch of this or operation and it's going to just completely ignore its second argument and just return true. So this argument is never going to be evaluated and therefore this does not raise an exception. But of course, if we were using a strict call by value semantics, then we would evaluate this second argument and this example one binding would produce an exception. Now, I want to be very, very clear about something, which is that I'm not really making the case that one of these semantics is better than the other. In fact, I think, frankly, arguably, um, there's a sense in which I actually think the strict semantics is nicer because, again, since I only use exceptions for cases where there's a bug in my program, theoretically speaking, all other things being equal, if I don't care about performance at all, I'd rather know that there's a bug in my program. But again, that's going to be extremely unlikely. This is not a real example that someone would write. And obviously, if I were to say, oh, you know, it'd be great if I could just run all my code in my program to determine if there's a bug, then we could also start saying, well, maybe we should start evaluating both branches of, of a then and an else, which, um, you know, is obviously not very useful. So the purpose of this is just to demonstrate that there are semantic differences between using strict and lazy evaluation. And because of those semantic differences, there are different constraints or, or the constraints expressed by the programs that we've written place different obligations on the compiler. 
So in order to illustrate perhaps in a more direct way what I mean, I'd like to take a look at a second example that I have hidden down here. And this example is, again, just, you know, very, very much pseudocode, similar to the C example from the previous video. But just imagine that you have some program that has some if then else, and it has a condition like this. And in this particular case, um, you know, suppose that evaluating condition two is actually very expensive, but condition one is true most of the time. Then if we were working in a strict language, we might say, okay, um, well, and of course, this is a little bit, uh, maybe a, a bad example because <laughs> in strict languages, normally or is short circuiting and I'll come back to that. But if we imagine that or were strict, then we could say, um, perhaps there would be some optimization that I could make on this program by rearranging it uh, in the following way. All right, so here is a, um, you know, syntactic transformation that I've made on this program that, in my opinion, is semantically equivalent to the original program, because again, I don't expect that condition two will raise an exception. That's something that should only happen if there's a bug. And so I don't really care about uh, raising an exception here if there's a bug in my program. And what I've done here is I've said, if condition one is true, then we just immediately do something. We don't even bother to evaluate condition two. And otherwise, uh, you know, we do evaluate it and we do exactly the same thing if it's true. So this is equivalent to what I have before, but it's short circuiting, right? It avoids evaluating this particular um, expression when it's not necessary. And if, and, and here's the really interesting thing, if we go back to the, the original program, that modified version of the program is semantically identical to this original program if we're using lazy evaluation semantics. What that means is that the compiler is free to make that transformation to the nested ifs at compile time if we're using a lazy evaluation semantics. But if we're using a strict evaluation semantics, then that's no longer the case. That transformation is technically no longer semantics preserving. And you know why is it technically no longer semantics preserving? Again, because there's some possibility, no matter how small, that this particular function could, uh, you know, when evaluated, raise an exception. So because of that, the compiler has to be very, very conservative, even in Haskell, and it has to keep things, uh, you know, in this way. And we'd have to manually introduce that optimization if we wanted it. Now, to me, this is very unsatisfying because, again. I just want to be able to write, and I think, I think for C programmers, sometimes they they take umbrage with this. They they think you know uh, the compiler shouldn't be messing with my program. But I think as Haskell programmers, we certainly all agree that it's really really nice that we can write a high level specification of what we want our program to do, and the compiler will try to you know realize that in a really efficient way. And so to me, it's very frustrating if I you know if every program I write ends up being wildly over constrained, and it prevents the compiler from being able to do that. Because again, in this particular case, laziness is getting us a performance speed up, but there's no thunks in here. There's no suspensions. Not, <laughs> nothing, nothing about that has been introduced. We're just talking about semantics and that transformation gives us a performance improvement without the need to ever bring thunks into the picture. Now, I know that many people are going to look at this and have two sort of quibbles with what I'm saying. The first is that, well, okay, or in most strict languages is actually short circuiting uh, as sort of a special case. And, and that's true. And so, you know, we could say, well, okay, uh, you know, maybe in a strict language, <clears throat> we would still have that. But of course, that's not very Haskell-y because you can define your own operators. So really, and this is kind of the second point, um, I think what you would want if you had a strict Haskell would be to have some way to have opt-in laziness of that source, right? And I think this is often what people sort of propose as the alternative to a strict language or, or to a lazy, uh, a lazy by default language. They say, well, why don't we just make it so that I can go in here and I can say, this is a lazy pool explicitly, or, you know, maybe there's some, maybe, maybe if we have a really fancy language, I could just have some little annotation that says that this argument is lazy. Now, of course, I don't really know exactly what this would mean. The challenge of, of having these like lazy annotations is that um, it's actually kind of difficult to pin down to what extent that affects the program. Does that mean that like if I have a function that wraps this, then I also have to, you know, apply the laziness annotation? So one way to be much more explicit is to explicitly say we have some lazy bool, which is like a promise, and there's an operation called force, and of course this is what most languages do, and then we have something called delay. And delay is sort of special, and it, you know, is essentially like creating a zero argument function. Um, but 
the result is is cached. And what this allows us to do is now we have this, you know, explicit laziness. We've been strict by default. We've introduced a little tiny bit of laziness. And in theory, this would allow a compiler to then rearrange this program and do the transformation that I was doing before, in spite of the fact that semantics are strict. Now, I will confess, every imperative programming language compiler, or just really compiler in general, that I'm aware of would not perform that kind of optimization automatically. And one of the reasons for that, I think, is that um, even though we've introduced a little bit of laziness, the language is still strict. And so evaluation order is actually still 100% defined. And what I mean by that is uh, under a purely, you know, strict call by value evaluation semantics, um, the required semantics is that condition one is evaluated and this expression is evaluated as well. Um, of course, the evaluation of this just allocates a thunk. And then we, uh, you know, execute this function, we call it, we find out if this one's false, if it is false, then we drop down to here, and then we force this particular value. And so this, you know, explicit forcing that we're doing here, um, most languages just interpret this as, again, you know, in a strict way, this is a very operational thing. Now, I think in theory, you could have a language that is significantly less literal about it, that, that does the kinds of complicated, um, you know, uh, analyses that GUC does. Although, honestly, I don't know exactly how you would implement it. It would have to be a very different thing. It would require new research. But even given that, even considering that I think this might be possible to do in theory, there's something unsatisfying about this. Because what we're doing here, again, is in, in, the, in the lazy version of our program, we didn't have to write anything. And, uh, you know, things just kind of worked out. We didn't have to think about which things had to be lazy. We didn't have to worry about these specific little details. We didn't have to pin down and say, this thing should be lazy and this thing should be strict. And again, as Haskell programmers, what we would like to be able to do is we would like to be able to just express the constraints that we want, uh, you know, behaviorally on our program. And we maybe don't even want to commit to lazy evaluation or strict evaluation. We want the compiler to decide that for us most of the time. And perhaps there are some situations where as a performance optimization, we want to override the compiler's decision. So I think from that perspective, what maybe it seems like we really want is not a strict language or a lazy language, but a non-strict language. So lazy is on one end of the spectrum, which says, you know, we, we, we delay evaluation as long as possible. And strict means we evaluate everything immediately. But what if we could have some point somewhere in the middle? where GHC would then automatically decide on a case-by-case -case basis, you know, this should be lazy, this should not be lazy, and maybe it could even default to being strict. Now, I'm not going to go into this in this video because we're already getting a little bit long on time, but I actually think that lazy by default is that universe. That is the non-strict evaluation semantics that I'm describing because in situations where, you know, we don't write anything, um, I haven't written any strictness annotations or any laziness annotations. What GHC will do is it will analyze our functions and determine, uh, you know, this argument should be lazy, this argument should be strict. And so it's already making that decision in the background. So the lazy semantics allows the compiler to sort of decide which things should be lazy and which things should be strict. Now, I know that what I've just described is going to sound at odds with a number of people's experiences and intuitions, because they're going to say, well, okay, but, um, you know, GHC ends up introducing all these thunks, and I don't like thunks. And it seems like if GHC were non-strict, then it could choose to, you know, do these kinds of transformations that I'm just describing that don't involve introducing thunks, but at least it wouldn't be generating all, this, all of those thunks. And I'm essentially going to make the case that if you really think that through, this turns out to be very hard to design in a way that, again, gives the compiler that flexibility. And I actually think that thunks are not always actually something that we should be viewing as a pessimization. And they tend to actually just be a symptom of something deeper, which is not an aspect of the language, but is an aspect of something else. And in order to, uh, to, to find out what that is, you're going to have to watch the next video. So I'm gonna leave this off here for today. And I hope to see you in the next part.